OK. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm going to talk about, the, of course, the well-known work of uh, James Clerk Maxwell in structural engineering. OK? And, um, and so the title of our talk is Maxwell and the Geometry of Structural mm -hmm. Engineering. Uh, Alan McRoby and I are going to do it together. I'm listed here as an honorary professor here, uh, or emeritus honorary professor. But I actually have that, my day job, I'm a structural engineer, and I design buildings. OK? And, and we're going to talk about the journey we've had in, in, in uncovering a lot, a lot of very unknown uh, contributions of, of, of Maxwell. Uh, now, Mac, uh, here we are at the structural mechanics in the mid-1800s. Uh, uh, you know, the, the first modern uh, structural theorist was Galileo with his work on cantilever structures and proportions of bones and stuff like that. And th then you have you know, the usual suspects uh, until you get to the mid-1800s. Uh, the mid uh, with people like Rankin and, and, and Maxwell. And uh, three particularly important people were Airy, uh, who was the astronomer royal, but he did a lot of very important work in structural engineering. Uh, Rankin, who was actually a professor of civil engineering up in Glasgow. And then, and then of course, uh, James Clark Maxwell. And uh, there was a very interesting thing ha happening in England at that time, or that Britain at that time, the railroad, OK? And so the first metal trusses in the US came in uh, 1840 here in the UK in 1845. And so there's very, very interesting, the, these big structures were being built. And of course, it went, went, uh, was not unnoticed by, by uh, uh, young people at the time, such, such, as, uh, such as Maxwell. And it's interesting to look at uh, Maxwell's uh, background in structural mechanics prior. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on some papers <coughs> written between 1864 and 1870, which is a time frame that a lot of people have been talking about up here. Uh, when he was doing his work in electromagnetic theory, it, it overlaps, at least chronologically. Anyway, so prior to 1864, uh, you know, he studied under Forbes at Edinburgh. He, he studied things like, uh, as you guys would say, catenaries. We would say catenaries. Uh, you know, so he, he knew the mathematics of, of that type of structure. Uh, he, um, and when he was like 18 or 19 years old, he published uh, his paper on, on the uh, equilibrium of elastic solids. I think it was here at, at the... At the at this, uh, uh, the Cambridge Philosophical Society. Uh, anyway, and then of course, uh, 1854, on the transformation of surfaces by bending. And then uh, he was the reviewer on this paper by Airy on the strains in the interior of beams. Now, at the, uh, about that time, just before that, Robert Stevenson had designed the Britannica Bridge, which is a big box, uh, square box ex uh, extrusion. And I guess Airy was very curious about what's going on in that box. And he wrote this very, very seminal paper, which uh, led to some, what we now call the Airy stress function. And, and, the, and when he submitted it to the Royal Society, the two reviewers, I understand, were Maxwell and Rankin. OK? And he also taught at King's College. And he, and he refers to teaching what I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, graphic statics. He taught that to his students while he was a professor at King's College down in London. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, his, a very good, uh, his cousin, his good friend, I think his best man at his wedding, uh, uh, William Dice Clay, was a civil engineer. So he, these guys were all surrounded by uh, engineers. I think uh, uh, Thompson's, uh, Lord Calvin's brother, was also uh, an engineer. The, um, anyway, so uh, one of the things he introduced is something called reciprocal figures and, uh, and uh, graphic statics. It started with a paper by this uh, scary-looking guy, Rankin from, uh, from Glasgow, and he wrote this paper. Here it is. This is the entire paper. Three paragraphs, four, four sentences, okay, published in the uh, uh, Royal Society. He, and he wrote it, in, he submitted it in January uh, 1864. It was published in February, okay. And then, uh, and it talked about the equilibrium of, of, of polyhedral frames. And Alan will talk a bit about this, where you have if you have these two reciprocal three-dimensional stru uh, structures, uh, the forces in one is, is described by the area of the, f of the face of the other. Anyway, so that inspired him. Remember, he, that was published in January. Uh, uh, our, our, uh, Maxwell to publish this in April. OK, talk about a turnaround. Uh, anyway, so he wrote, here's his paper on reciprocal figures and diagrams of forces. Uh, and uh, the first paragraph is, Reciprocal figures are such that the properties of the first relative to the second are the same as the second relative to the first. So you essentially have this mapping function that takes you from one figure to the next, and that same mapping takes you back to the original. And then he goes, uh, then he goes on to say, 
Thus, in inverse figures and polar reciprocals are, are instances of two different kinds of reciprocity. I had absolutely no idea what that meant, okay? Uh, for everyone in the room who knows what a polar reciprocal is, I had a clue as to what an inverse figure was, but I had no idea what a polar reciprocal was. And to understand Maxwell, you got to understand projective geometry. And so, uh, uh, and so here are reciprocal figures. It's a roof truss, okay? Uh, on the left, you see the figure of a roof truss. On the right, you see the forces in that truss. For, uh, every, uh, every node on the left maps to a, is in equilibrium. The forces, the vectors coming in that node are in equilibrium. So every node maps to a polygon. Every line has a parallel a little line. And, and the length of the line in the force diagram is, the, is, is, is how big the forces are. And then uh, every polygon maps to a node. And so if you were an engineer, in the, in the, after Maxwell wrote his paper, uh, you would, uh, you'd have this uh, line of vectors of, of your, uh, your, your applied loads and reactions, and then you'd get it, go to your drafting table, and you would measure the forces by parallel lines. So the, uh, on, the, on the left, you see capital A and 1, that, uh, that inclined line. The force in that member is, is the length from A to 1. So you could actually measure your forces. In fact, at, at one time, uh, you couldn't get a permit in the state of Wisconsin unless you had this diagram on your drawings, OK? <laughs> the, uh, anyway, so just going through it, and some of those members have zero forces when they have two dots at the same place. You just analyze the truss, OK? And, and, and as, as Maxwell said, so, so now, you, now you have the forces. They're reciprocal. So here they are, OK? I'm going to make them into reciprocal diagrams. I'm going to go around the first figure like this. And now, the figure on the left are the forces in the structure on the right. So it's a reciprocal of maps. So whenever you do graphic statics, you, do not, you, you analyze one structure, but you create two structures. And each structure has the same internal energy. Because, uh, uh, because the length of uh, gives you one diagram gives you the length of, of, the, of the member, the other gives you the length of the force. And you just reverse them. OK? But why do we care today? It's an incredible design tool. And it's really taken off in the last few years. So l let's say you don't like those forces. Let's so say you want that, that, that roof truss to have a constant force along the diagonal. So draw the forces. And then see what the rest of the structure looks like. Ta-da. You've done it. Graphically. Reciprocal diagrams. And this has been done, you know, uh, Maillard did this about 100 years ago. Uh, in fact, Robert Maillard, who, the, the engineer who dealt most, some of the most beautiful bridges in the world, uh, did it by graphic statics. See those lines there? Those are his calculations. Those lines, those dots and lines are the, are the calculations in that trust. OK, Maxwell published this in an engineering magazine. Here it is. Uh, the, the author is James Clark Maxwell. It's in The Engineer, uh, November uh, 1867. So he, they, were, they were very connected to the engineering community. OK, uh, here's another truss with an equilibrium. So on the left is, the, is the, the truss. On the right are the forces. And I'm going to borrow a trick from, uh, from Rankin. And I'm going to make, the, I've now created a self-stressed structure. So if I know the force in one of those red members, I know the force in all of them to be in equilibrium. And I know what it is because of the way I drew it graphically. Maxwell observed that it has to be a projection of a plane face polyhedron. Go. All right. So for a structure to be an, equal, an axial equilibrium, it has to be a projection of a plane face polyhedron. And the change in, in slope of uh, all the ridges are compression members, all the valleys are tension members, and the force is proportional to the, uh, to the angle change. And I was first showed this by Professor Caladine there, who, 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 who first exposed this, that, that the fact that these are, these are actually the airy stress function. OK? And, and there you have the structural part uh, separately. OK? And it turns out, uh, then in a paper, a seminal paper he wrote uh, in 1870, now he's called uh, Reciprocal Figures, Frames, and uh, uh, Diagrams of Forces. When they said frame, uh, we would call it a truss, but they, they use the term frames. OK? And so he, he had this thing where you have points and planes are polar, reciprocally polar in the ordinary sense with respect to 
preloid of revolution. And so he had this, this geometric projective geometry transformation between these two figures where every plane maps to a point and every point uh, maps to a plane. Uh, and there's different ways to do it. So you have the recess, uh, reciprocity of polyhedra, nodes to edge faces, edge to edge, faces to nodes. And so remember this guy, he has a, he's a projection of a plane face polyhedron. Guess what? There's a reciprocal polyhedron that projects to the forces. And so we have the, now we have these four objects, the two-dimensional projections and the three-dimensional uh, area stress functions, okay? And, and so uh, any, uh, any, th any plane face polyhedron projects to a, um, uh, projects, let me see if I can get this thing to go. All right, where is it? Oh, well, never mind. Uh, any plane face polyhedron, the two-dimensional projection is a structure in equilibrium. Uh, and this, uh, here's a roof we were designing uh, where every face is exactly flat. Because if you, if you design your structure to be a projection of, of a equilibrium, you can create an area stress function where every face is exactly flat. Every, every polygon there is exactly flat. And, and uh, this is the, the form diagram, this is the force diagram. Okay, another thing he came up, and um, this, this is a theorem he was totally lost. Uh, it, uh, it was known for a little bit around the early part of the, 19th century, of the 20th century, around uh, 1904. It resurrected a little bit in the 1960s, but it, it had been used theoretically, but not in, in practice. And it's also in this, that paper from 1870. Uh, and I'm gonna give you a, a little quick proof. Let's say you had this truss and it's in equilibrium, okay? And, and, and then uh, there are all the forces, the redder the compression forces, the greener the tensile, tensile forces. And I'm gonna throw the structure away, but keep the forces. So all of the, 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 the truss elements are gone, but the forces are still there. Every node is in equilibrium. I'm gonna dilate the space. So uh, uh, all, of the, all of the compression members are now twice as long. They did positive work. All the compression, uh, tension members are twice as long. They did negative work. And also, all the uh, external forces have been moved, so they, they also did work. But they have to add to zero, because we've made, because they were already in equilibrium, so they have really done no work. And so you, you end up with this equation, this incredible equation here, uh, we call this the Maxwell, that, that the, the sum of all the tension members minus the sum of all the compression members is equal to this uh, dot product. That dot product is often constant. So if you have an inefficient structure, you pay for it exactly twice, once in tension and once in compression. I'll give you a couple examples. I was working on this project down in London. It's next, uh, project never got built. This is next to Waterloo uh, uh, train station. Uh, this building has eight tunnels under it. It has uh, the Jubilee Line, the Northern Line, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Bakerloo, and the Waterloo and, uh, and city lines under it. So there's almost no dirt under this building left. Uh, and so uh, we designed this structure that could span over it. And so using, uh, because of that theorem, we only have to calculate the tension members. We do not have to calculate the compression members. Plus, and so we were able, to, uh, th through this process, uh, calculate the entire uh, volume of structure in the entire building by only calculating the tension members. Okay, and so we go this, and so we create for our client this chart that shows how many kilograms of steel per square meter he has based on Maxwell's theorem. Okay, and guess what? It worked. Okay, we nailed it. Okay, uh, so our, our values are right. Uh, every time you go to uh, London and you go to Liverpool Street uh, Station, you go under this building I designed. Th this is just north of, uh, of, uh, um, of Liverpool Street Station. And uh, when we designed this thing, we had to come up with the optimal height of the arch. So what we did, we guessed the height. We then calculated all the columns, all the hangers, the arch, and the tie. And then we guess another height, and we calculate all the columns, the hangers, the arch, and the tie. And, and then we put it in a chart, and we try to figure where the, it took us weeks. With Maxwell's low path theorem, which I did not know then, you can do it in about an hour, okay? All you have to do is calculate, and the reason it's, a, it's an arch is because all the tracks coming out of uh, Liverpool Street Station, there's no place to bring up, down a, a regular structure, okay? That's why it's a bridge, a building that's a bridge. Anyway, so those are the only members you need to calculate the hangers and the tie. And you can optimize, you can not only optimize the structure, you can calculate the total volume of material, okay? So, 
Uh, here it is, uh, kind of dimensionalized. So uh, here's the calculation for the hangers. Here's the calculation for the tie. I add them together. And so, and so if I minimize that, I will come up with the optimal height of the arch. That's it. Now, if I want to know the total volume of material, I take, uh, this is Maxwell's uh, number, which is basically the weight of the building at times half the height. And then I take uh, the columns only, if, it, if we're sitting on the ground, then I add in the, 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 the hangers and the tie times twice, and that gives me the entire load path of the entire structure without ever calculating one of the comp compression members. That, that buys the, the arch and all the, uh, and all the columns without ever calculating them. <laughs> Don't talk about all the uh, Buckley criteria. Uh, 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 the, uh, the Buckley may change the stress. But what, what you do is you take the stress that, that's appropriate for the structure. And this is very, uh, 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 they, the, 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 tension, the stress between the, uh, you know the tensile stresses, you know the compressive stresses, and you take the tensile members divided by their stress, the compression members are divided by their stress, which is set by buckling, uh, and you just add them together, okay? And so there is the, the entire uh, uh, energy, if you will, uh, in the building. Okay, so the question is, what else did Maxwell do in engineering mechanics? So we bought, the, we, bought the, we went to uh, uh, Cambridge University Press, we bought the collective works, and we, and we sat down and we tried to read them, and we kept on running into stuff like this. I had no idea what that meant. These points and planes are, are reciprocally polar in the ordinary sense, okay? Ordinary sense, you're all supposed to know this, uh, with respect to our paraboloid of revolution. Because Maxwell assumed his readers knew what he knew and we no longer knew, know what they knew, per, particularly projective geometry. We no longer know projective geometry, and that was essential to understanding that. So Alan and I, and, and, and Marina and Petya back there, uh, decided it was time to get a book. So the geometry of equilibrium, James Clark Maxwell in the 21st century, structural mechanics. But we have a series of chapters by physicists and uh, rigidity theory people and, and, and geometers about how they use Maxwell today, uh, and then uh, then we have a, about 10 chapters where we talk about uh, Maxwell's structural principles uh, in detail. And then uh, what is, I think, very useful, and I urge some of you guys in other fields to do this, we, we took Maxwell's original text, transcribed them. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. Uh, anyway, so Maxwell's original text, we, we numbered all the paragraphs, and then we translated from English to English. Okay. <laughs> And we added a lot of pictures, okay? And so, because, and in the process, we discovered things that had been forgotten. And I bet there's a lot of other stuff out there that we don't know about. And a lot of it was not, um, um, the tools of their time, sometimes the ideas were ahead of the tools of the time. There's a lot of stuff that does with geometry, especially the higher order geometry, that they could not draw, that today we can draw with graphical tools. And so here's an example, and now I'm going to turn it to my colleague. I ran five minutes over uh, my part, but <laughs> so for Talon. Mm -hmm.